Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for another exciting Wu University event. My name is Dr. Stephanie Wu. I am the founder of Wu University, and I am your host for this evening. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Leonard Mesner. Dr. Mesner was a graduate of the Pennsylvania College of Optometry, and then he completed a primary eye care residency also at the Pennsylvania College of Optometry. He is the Vice President for Patient Care Services for the Illinois College of Optometry and the Executive Director of the Illinois Eye Institute. He is also a past chair of the Neuro-Ophthalmic Disorders Special Interest Group of the American Academy of Optometry. He is a member of the advisory board of the Concussion Legacy Foundation, and he serves on the research committee as well. He's an author of numerous peer-reviewed publications and textbook chapters in the areas of vitreoretinal disease and neuroophthalmic disorders. He is a 23-time recipient of the Teacher of the Year Award at the Illinois College of Optometry. And this is so exciting because this is our very first neuro-optometry course and Dr. Mesner came highly recommended from many of our friends and colleagues. And it's, a, it's an honor for him to be here to teach us. Dr. Mesner, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Well, thank you, Dr. Wu. It's a pleasure uh, to be with all of you this evening. And these are my financial disclosures. And the, it's really a, it really is a special treat to be with all of you this evening to talk about OCT in a variety of neuroophthalmic disorders, including papilledema, pseudopapilledema, multiple sclerosis, and some other neurodegenerative disorders. These are the key points of my presentation. I'm going to begin with a discussion of OCT findings in the setting of both papilledema as well as pseudopapilledema. I'm going to talk a little bit about OCT findings with chiasmal as well as retrochiasmal visual pathway lesions. And then from there, we're going to bridge to a discussion, what I think is a very uh, 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 exciting discussion of the, the evolution of OCT as a biomarker of disease activity or stability among individuals with a variety of neurodegenerative disorders, including MS, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, and then finally, some of the research that we've been doing as it relates to traumatic brain injury and chronic traumatic encephalopathy. So with that, let's begin with a definition of papilledema. And very simply, you can think of papilledema as both swelling and elevation of the optic nerves, both due to elevated intracranial pressure. Now, pseudopapilledema really is nothing more than an anomalous disc. It's a congenitally anomalous disc where there is elevation to the optic nerve in the absence of disc swelling, but with anatomical features that are very, very common in these individuals, notably the presence of a small or an absent cup. And these, these anomalous nerves may be or become associated or develop optic disc drusen. And we'll talk a lot about optic disc drusen a little bit later. So before I get into the OCT findings of papilledema, I would like to talk a little bit about the stages of papilledema or the grading scale. And the grading scale that is commonly used in neuroophthalmology is the Friesen scale that was, that was developed back in the early 1980s. So with the Friesen scale, a grade one papilledema, these are the earliest clinical findings that we see. We're looking at the optic nerve. There is something of a circumferential corona of, of, of optic disc swelling with sparing of the papillomacular bundle fibers, or what is generally referred to as a C-shaped pattern of optic disc edema. Now, stage two, or grade two rather, is more of a complete circumferential ha halo of disc swelling now, including the papillomacular bundle fibers. Grade three are all of the findings in grade two, but now you begin to see obscuration of the major blood vessels as they are leaving the optic disc. Grade four is all of the findings of grade three, but now there is evidence of vessel obscuration of the major vessels on the surface of the optic disc, 
And then finally, grade five, where we have all of the findings of grade four, but now all of the vessels on the surface of the disc are obscured. And this is also where you begin to see this filling in of the optic cup with axoplasmic material that essentially is left behind from dead and dying axons. Now, over the past probably 10 years, uh, OCT has helped us enormously in the evaluation, the diagnosis, and the longitudinal management of individuals with papilledema. And what I've listed for you here are some of the common findings that are associated with most cases of papilledema, beginning with an increase in, in the thickness of both the retinal nerve fiber layer, as well as the neuroretinal rim, or as it is now referred to as the minimum rim width. In addition to that, there is a significant elevation of the optic nerve where it's elevated above the floor of the retina. Typically with papilledema, the central cup is maintained. It can be pushed up and elevated, but that central cup is maintained until very late in the disease. There is sometimes the presence of a hyporeflective V-shaped or, or, or sideways V-shaped zone of what is thought to be subretinal fluid at the disc margin. And this is termed the recumbent or the lazy V sign. One of the newer findings that is identifiable with papilledema is the presence of peripapillary inner retinal folds. And we typically see these more on the temporal side of the optic nerve as compared to on the nasal side. And then finally, inward deflection of the RPE Brooks membrane complex. And this is something that we sort of, you really just eyeball it. It's not a matter of putting a number on it. Uh, at some point in time, hopefully there will be nomograms that can actually look at the angle of deflection. But this is very, very, essentially, this is <clears throat> really what you're seeing or what we see when we look at the MRI of an individual with papilledema where you get that flattening of the posterior eye wall. That's pretty much, that's pretty much what this inferior, in, inward rather deflection of the RPE Brooks membrane complex represents. And this is present in roughly about two thirds of individuals with papilledema. So I'd like to begin with a case. And a lot of what I'm going to be doing this evening is show and tell. So here's a case of a 32 year old woman who comes in to see you complaining of progressive headaches that are worse in the morning and somewhat dissipate toward the end of the day. Her BMI is significantly elevated at 41. We know that over 30 is obese, over 40 is morbidly obese. And her visual acuities are quite good, 20-20 in the right eye, 20-20 in the left eye. And if we look at the optic nerve in the right eye, well, what you can see here is this circumferential corona of optic disc swelling with some obscuration of the major retinal blood vessels as they leave the optic nerve. So this would be consistent with a grade three papilledema. And similarly, in the fellow eye, we see very, very similar findings. Uh, circumferential corona of optic disc swelling, maybe a little bit of intraretinal hemorrhage here at about the, at about the 10 or 11 o'clock position. If we look at this individual's brain, and this is a T1 weighted MRI uh, that is a mid-sagittal view. So we're, we're going straight down the midline on a sagittal section. And what I wanna point out to you here is how the pituitary gland is grossly flattened against the floor of the cella. This is the empty cella sign uh, that we commonly see among individuals with elevated intracranial pressure and particularly with idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Now, getting to the OCTs, what you can see here are grossly thickened nerve fiber layers where we're over 200 microns of average thickness in the right eye and close to 200 of microns of average thickness in the left eye. Now, Looking at the OCT, and this is a raster scan that is taken through the center of the optic nerve. So let's look at some of the findings that I just articulated a couple of moments ago. First of all, you can see that the entirety of the optic nerve is grossly elevated above the surface of the retina, a bit more so on the nasal side as compared to on the temporal side. You can also see that the central cup is relatively preserved. It too is elevated, but the cup is preserved. What you can see here in the peripapillary region is this 
I'm sorry, before we get to that, I'd like to call your attention to the RPE Brooks complex. Now, the RPE Brooks complex is this hyper reflective band that I'm pointing to here on the temporal side of the disc and here on the nasal side of the disc. Now, under normal circumstances, we would expect to see this RPE Brooks membrane complex bowing backwards in something of a curvilinear fashion as it follows the anatomical curva curvature of the globe. But this is the subarachnoid space of the optic nerve that I'm pointing to here, which is directly contiguous with the subarachnoid space of the brain. So as pressure is building up, it is pushing that RPE Brooks complex somewhat inward. And so that's what I'm drawing here with this line is the normal curvature below and this inward deflection of the RPE Brooks complex that we can see here in the setting of elevated intracranial pressure. Going along with this all, here you can see these hypo-reflective spaces here on the nasal side of the disc, here on the temporal side of the disc, this recumbent or lazy V sign, which is thought to perhaps be fluid that is now accumulating within the subretinal space. Let's take in another look, look at another case. This is a 28-year-old woman who also com comes in to see you complaining of chronic daily headaches. In addition to that, she's complaining of synchronous pulsatile tinnitus. So the swishing sound with the beat of her heart that she hears on a regular basis. If we look at her BMI, once again, it is significantly elevated at 39. Her visual acuities are normal, 20-20 in the right eye. 2020 in the left eye. And when we look at the optic nerves, what you can see here is gross elevation as well as a circumferential halo of optic disc edema, both here in the right eye as well as here in the left eye. And if we look at the OCTs, once again, we see that both optic nerves are significantly elevated above the floor of the retina we see that there is this inward deflection of the RPE Brooks complex here in the right eye and also here in the left eye. But if we blow up the left eye and we look specifically at the left eye, what I'm pointing to here for you is this wrinkling of the inner retinal layers on the temporal side of the optic nerve. And this, and this is most pronounced when the individual looks in toward their nose or into a position of adduction. And that's because this nerve is more or less kinked in this anatomical position of gaze. So with that, there is going to be more of a buildup of fluid within the subarachnoid space. If the individual abducts or turns their eye out, Oftentimes these inner retinal folds will minimize and sometimes go away altogether as there is less of a buildup or there is less of a pressure within the subarachnoid space of the optic nerve. Here's a case of a 40 year old woman, chronic daily headaches along with synchronous pulsatile tinnitus. Her BMI is significantly elevated at 44. And her visual acuities, you can see here now, are also, are also affected. She has 20-40 vision in the right eye, 20-40 vision in the left eye. And when we look at the fundi, what you can see here is grade 5 papal edema, where there is this gross elevation to the optic nerves, both here in the right eye, here in the left eye, obscuration of all vascular detail on the surface of the optic nerves. We can see that the central cup is, is, is pretty well filled in here in the right eye and here in the left. And one of the most compelling, uh, one, of the, one, one, of the most, one of the most serious findings is we can also see that the optic nerves are beginning to show something of a paled appearance. Now, looking at the OCTs, what you can see is dramatic thickening of the retinal nerve fiber layer in both eyes, literally, literally off the charts. And then looking at the raster scans, what you can see is this almost champagne cork or dome-like appearance of the optic nerves with this complete obliteration of the optic cups. Here's a case of a 32-year-old woman with progressive debilitating headaches of several months duration. She has a normal neurologic exam. 
Her visual acuities are excellent at 2020 in the right eye, 2020 in the left eye, and she has a BMI that is significantly elevated at 38. When we look at the optic nerve in the right eye, she has what would easily be characterized as a stage three grade of papilledema. And in the fellow eyes, similarly, at least a grade three encroaching upon grade four papilledema. But what we can also see is that the optic nerves are fairly pink, suggesting that they're still pretty well perfused. Now, looking at the visual fields, what you can see is that there are enlarged blind spots, both in the right eye as well as in the left eye. We can see that the retinal nerve fiber layers are significantly thickened, um, 386 microns on average in the right, 442 in the left. And then looking at the MRI, this is what I was referring to before, this flattening of the posterior sclera that we see among individuals with elevated intracranial pressure and particularly with idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So what you can see on this T2-weighted uh, axial cut through the orbits is this flattening of the globe here on the right side, here on the left side, and then along with that, you can see this abnormal dilatation uh, of, the, uh, of, of the subarachnoid space of the optic nerve. So the nerves are kinked with the subarachnoid space being dilated here on the right and to a certain extent here on the left. Now, looking at the rest of the brain and particularly looking at the pituitary gland, which you can see in this T1 weighted image on the left and also this T2 weighted image on the right is this flattening of the pituitary gland against the floor of the cella. So this is the empty cella sign that we commonly see in the setting of idiopathic intracranial hypertension. And the reason that you get that is because pressure is building up here within the supracellar cistern. And it's literally taking the pituitary gland, which is roughly the consistency of jello and it's flattening it against the floor of the cella. But we want to focus on the OCT findings and here we can see this young woman's OCT. So all the noteworthy features that I indicated to you previously, an elevation of the optic nerve, preservation of the cent oops, preservation of the central cup in the right eye. Here you can see these hyporeflective notched out areas within the peripapillary region, here on the nasal side of the nerve, here on the temporal side of the nerve. You can nicely see this inward deflection of the RPE Brooks complex. And what you can, and finally, I call your attention to these inner retinal folds, this pleated appearance to the retina, notably on the temporal side of the disc. And when we look at the fellow eye, you see almost a carbon copy of these findings, elevated nerve, preservation of the cup, inward deflection of the RPE Brooks complex, recumbent or lazy V sign, and then on the temporal side of the nerve, these inner retinal folds. Now, uh, this woman, uh, I, I started this woman on 500 milligrams of acetazolamide twice a day. And along with her medical management, she was quite good at losing weight over a period of six months. She shed about 25 pounds. She noticed a significant improvement in her headaches. And when we see her back six months later, you can now see that her nerve fiber layer is still a bit thickened, but certainly much, much less than it was initially. Looking at her ganglion cell complex, and again, this is really the litmus test as it relates to the integrity of the, uh, of, of the optic nerve as measured by the integrity or the thickness of the ganglion cells. We see that there is a normal and plush appearance to the ganglion cell complex here in the right eye, as well as in the left eye. Looking at the topography of the optic nerves, looking at the raster scans, you can see that they're definitely flattening down. And then 14 months later, she continued to do a good job of losing weight. At this point, she was off of her Diamox for three months. Her BMI had gone from 38 down to 30. She's headache free. And you can see that her optic nerve looks essentially normal in the right eye, normal in the left eye, nice pink appearance normal appearance to the retinal nerve fiber layer, normal appearance to the ganglion cell complex, 
essentially normal flattening of the optic nerves bilaterally by raster scan and also looking at her visual fields essentially normalization of her visual fields. So this is a woman with the with the with idiopathic intracranial hypertension or the pseudotumor cerebri syndrome who has done extraordinarily well through both medical management as well as as well as weight loss uh, with, uh, with, with, you know, with, uh, and, and certainly we can see with the OCTs, this nice, um, uh, the, the, this, the, this, the, 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 the going back to a normal an anatomical basis of her optic nerve, of her optic nerve anatomy. So that's papilledema. Let's move on now and talk about pseudopapilledema, which I mentioned to you before is nothing more than an anomalous nerve. These individuals are born with small, with small posterior scleral foramina. So the way we like to explain this to our patients is that, look, every, everyone is born roughly with about a million axons, and those axons are leaving the posterior scleral foramen, or what is now termed the Brooks membrane opening, in order to get out of the eye and back to the visual centers within the brain. Now, if that opening is narrow, you're going to have that same million or so axons, but they're going through a smaller space. So they tend to, they tend to heap up on top of each other. And that's what leads to the elevation of the optic nerve. Now, specifically, as it relates to the OCT findings, sometimes you see significant thickening to the retinal nerve fiber layer, uh, as well as the neuroretinal rim, and sometimes you don't. Typically, we see a significant elevation to the optic nerve. Sometimes there is something of an irregular or lumpy, bumpy appearance to the optic disc margin, and this is due to the development of optic disc drusen. But what is important is what you don't see in the setting of pseudopapilledema as opposed to true papilledema. You don't get the fluid accumulation within the subarachnoids or within the subretinal space at the optic disc margins. You essentially have absence or a very tiny central cup because that's essentially what's causing the anomalous appearance to the nerve to begin with. And then finally, you do not see this inward deflection of the RPE Brooks complex. There is more of a neutral or a negative contour of the RPE, RPE Brooks membrane deflection. So what about optic disc drusen? What can we say here? Well, this is an acquired phenomenon. And optic disc drusen are really nothing more than colloid bodies that form within the substance of the optic nerve due to degenerating axons. And there are a number of things that can cause axons to degenerate. But with an anomalous nerve, it's this, it's, it's this compartment syndrome. It's this compression of the, of, the, of, the, of the axonal bundles as they're attempting to leave the optic nerve. And over time, some of them give up, they die, and, that, and, that, and the material that is left behind forms these colloid bodies that are affectionately termed optic disc drusen. Now, uh, it's also important to, uh, to, to, to rem in, in these cases, the, op the, the nerve fiber layer, particularly early on with optic disc bruising, it can be normal or abnormally thickened. But if you look at these individuals over time, and I'm going to show you some examples of this, is that over time, what we progressively see is a thinning down of the retinal nerve fiber layer. And unfortunately, there's nothing that can really be done in order to prevent that. So what about OCT findings with optic disc screws? And well, this, this, uh, these findings were initially reported in the Journal of Neuroophthalmology by the Optic Disc Screws and uh, uh, Study co uh, or Consortium Committee in 2018 and modified uh, just recently. But it goes something like this: is that first of all, disc screws and as we evaluate them, the OCT are always located at least in part above the lamina cribrosa. Point two is that they always have a hyporeflective or a signal poor core. Point three is that we typically see something of a hyperreflective surround or border to the drusen, and this is oftentimes most prominent along the apex of the drusen. 
the net the point four is that not only can you see individual Druze, but oftentimes we can see clusters or conglomerates of Druze and where they're literally merging together. The fifth point is the presence of hyper-reflective horizontal lines. And I'm going to show you some examples of these. And initially, it was thought that these may represent precursors to developing optic discrusion, but now it's thought that they may be more just artifacts that are induced by overlying optic discrusion. And then finally, the presence of peripapillary hyperreflective ovoid mass like structures or FOMs. Now, FOMs are not a universe, are not a finding that is absolutely unique to anomalous nerves with optic disdrusion. We can, FOMs simply represent bulging axons. You can get bulging axons due to an anomalous nerve. You can get bulging axons from papilledema. You can also get bulging axons from other optic disc abnormalities, such as tilted optic nerves, uh, central retinal vein occlusion, where the optic disc is very congested, optic neuritis, where the optic nerve is also congested. So by no means is the presence of these FOMs something that is unique only to individuals with anomalous or, or, or pseudopapilledematous optic nerves. Now, getting back to how these, how this drusen appear both clinically as well as on the OCT. Well, here you have an individual that presents to you with normal vision, but an elevated appearance to the optic nerve. You can see that there's really no, uh, see there, there's no central cup. We can see that the major retinal blood vessels and even the minor retinal blood vessels are pretty much unobscured as they're coming out of the optic nerve and they distribute themselves along the, ret the uh, within the retina. But what you can see here, as I illustrate with these arrows, are these somewhat, uh, um, somewhat rock candy-like concretions, notably at the disc margin, that represent the optic disc drusen. Now, if we look at this same case and we take a cut through the superior portion of the optic nerve, and here's the reference photograph on the left, what you can see on the right is the raster scan through the optic nerve. And what I'm illustrating for you here initially are these ovoid lesions that have hypo or hypo reflective or signal poor cores. These are the buried druses. And you can see that the surround of the drusen is a little hyper-reflective, particularly at the apex. Here you can see, notably on the nasal side, as well as on the temporal side, evidence of a peripapillary hyper-reflective ovoid mass-like structure, or a FOMS. Here with the green arrows, I'm pointing to these horizontal hyper-reflective lines that are directly under the drusen that I've called your attention to earlier. And then finally, on the surface of the optic nerve, what I'm pointing out to you here are the normal retinal blood vessels. And you say to yourself, well, how can I distinguish between blood vessels and, and disc drusen? Well, first of all, blood vessels are going to be very, very superficial. Also, they're going to pretty much shadow everything below them. Drusen shadow a little bit, but not nearly to the extent that blood vessels do. And then the final point that I'd bring to your attention is that vessels, retinal blood vessels, are going to have a hyper-reflective internal core as, composed to, as compared to the signal poor core that we describe with optic disc drusen. Here's a 33-year-old woman who was sent to me for the evaluation of optic disc edema in her left eye. Her visual acuities are normal. Her neurologic exam is normal. She, you know, everything is essentially normal. But looking at her OCT on raster, what you can see is that there is this over, is there this global elevation to the optic nerve, absence of the central cup, essentially a slightly negative or at least a neutral deflection of the RPE Brooks complex. But what I'm pointing to you here, you can here you can see these aggregates of drusen here on the nasal side of the nerve, here on the temporal side of the nerve, and along with that, these hyper-reflective horizontal lines. And then superficially, we can see the normal retinal blood vessels.
Here's a case of a 29-year-old woman who was sent to me for the evaluation of, of, of presumed papilledema. Vision is normal, neurologic exam is normal, no headaches, no synchronous pulsatile tinnitus. Looking at her optic nerves, which you can see here are elevated discs bilaterally, but there's really no appreciable central cup. We can see that the blood vessels are really unobscured. So there's no, there's really no evidence. There's no clinical evidence of optic disc edema. But if you look very carefully, what you can see here are these concretions, notably on the border of the optic nerve here, notably nasally in the right eye, and here both temporal as well as nasal in the left eye. So this is presumably the optic disc drusen. Now, Looking at the fundus autofluorescence on the left and the B scan findings on the right, well, most of us were taught to, you know, if you suspect Drews and do a B scan, okay. Here you can see highly hyperreflective Drusen within the optic nerve in the right eye as well as in the left eye. But I think an easier way of doing this, particularly or illustrating this, particularly in kids, is to do fundus autofluorescence. So if you have that feature on your, you know, on your OCT or on your fundus camera, use it. So here we can see the fundus autofluorescence here in the right eye, here in the left eye. Not only can you see that there are optic disc grooves and that are hyper autofluorescing, but you can actually count them. You can see the morphology very, very nicely here in the right eye and here multiple disc grooves in, in the left eye. Now, looking at the OCT, this is a raster scan, just a little bit superior to the midline of the optic nerve. But what I'm pointing to you here is once again, this ovoid lesion within the optic nerve with a signal poor core, this is the optic disc drusen. And in the fellow eye, here once again, we can see similar aggregates of, ovoids, of ovoid lesions within the substance of the optic nerve, signal poor core, this is the optic disc drusen. 62-year-old woman comes in with a little bit of blurry vision in her right eye. She's got dry eye disease, which is most likely responsible for her vision problems. But what I'm showing you here are her optic nerves. These are her raster scans, elevated disc bilaterally, absence of the central cups. And then here you can see these ovoid structures within the optic nerves that, are, that, that have signal poor cores. These are the disc drews. So I think I've shown you, you know, an abundance of cases of optic disc grooves and sequentially. What I'd like to finish with now in our discussion of disc grooves and is this case of a seven-year-old young man who I first saw in 2013. And he was sent to me for the evaluation of papilledema. His visual acuity was normal, 20-20 in each eye, normal neurologic exam, no symptoms of elevated intracranial pressure, namely no chronic daily headaches, no synchronous pulsatile tinnitus, no double vision, or no transient and no transient vision loss. And looking at his photographs back in 2013, what you can see are elevated optic nerves, absence of the central cup, no obscuration of vascular detail, essentially no true evidence of optic disc swelling. And then looking at the B scans, what we can see are these hyperreflective areas here in the right eye, here in the left eye. These are the Drusen, but this was the this is the raster scan in 2013 of this young man's right eye. Elevated nerve, absence to the cup, negative deflection of the RPE Brooks complex. But what you can see here are multiple ovoid lesions within the substance of the optic nerve with signal poor cores. These are his optic disc Drusen. And here you can see really the same thing in the left eye. And here, on the temporal side of the nerve, you can see evidence of a peripapillary hyperreflective ovoid mass like structure of a FOMS. And remember, this is nothing more than bulging optic disc axons. So I've had the, I've had the opportunity to examine this individual multiple times over the past eight years. And here he is just December of 2019. What you can see now is that the drusen that were evident 
on B scan and on OCT are now becoming more visible. Now, we used to say, or it used to be thought that that was an anterior migration of the drusen, that that's why they became more, more visible. That's probably not true. Probably the real reason is because of this progressive thinning down of the retinal nerve fiber layer is that there's less obscuration of the optic disc drusen with time. Here's the fundus autofluorescence. Here are the, uh, here are the raster scans in September of 2019, uh, showing both the drusen as well as the hyperreflective horizontal lines below them. And then just recently in August of this year, you, here you can see once again, uh, these, these drusen that are sticking out rather in a rather uh, provocative fashion. Here you can see the same clinical appearance uh, on the raster scan with the OCT, just multiple drusen in both eyes. But what I'm showing you here are sequentially the OCT nerve fiber layer plot scans over time with this progressive thinning down of the neuroretinal rim over a period of years. And unfortunately, this is part of the, nor the, part of the natural history or the nor of, of what we expect to see in the setting of many individuals with optic distrus. And, uh, and not to get long-winded on this, but at the end of the day, unfortunately, there's nothing that can be done to prevent this. Now, what about these white rings? that we see surrounding the optic nerves among individuals that have anomalous optic nerves. We've already said that it's not optic disc swelling. What does this stuff represent? Now, personally, I think that what you're looking at here are these FOMs, these bulging axons, and that you can see this both with papilledema as well as with pseudopapilledema with or without optic disc drusen. But you know, this is a common finding with anomalous optic nerves is that clinically you see this something of a deep, not a superficial, but a deep white ring around the optic nerve that does not obscure the retinal blood vessels. And then here going all the way around the optic nerve, what you can see on raster are these FOMS like structures. I want to move on now and talk about OCT findings with chiasmal and retrochiasmal uh, lesions. Now, within the chiasm, we know that there are nasal fibers that come back from the optic nerves that cross or decussate within the optic chiasm. And along with these are ipsilateral fibers that are that come back that, that subserve the temporal region of the uh, of the retina that travel back in an uncrossed fashion. Now, going back to college physics, we know that if you're applying a force to a bunch of cylinders, it is those that are crossing that are going to bear the brunt of this force as compared to those that are going back in a parallel track. And that is why you get this, you get this preferential damage to the decussating nasal fibers within the optic chiasm, particularly in the setting of a mass lesion, notably a tumor of the pituitary gland or within the supracellar region that is that is that is that is that is that is applying this force, notably to the crossing fibers within the paracentral region of the chiasm. So just to illustrate this finding, and, and we can see and, and we can appreciate this now as it relates to OCT findings, notably on the G on the ganglion cell layer or the ganglion cell complex maps. Here's a case of a 40 year old man coming in complaining that his side vision has been getting a little blurry in both eyes over several months duration. Visual acuities are pretty good, 2020 in the right eye, 2020 minus a couple in the left eye. And if we look at his visual fields, well, you know, he has something on the left side that may look a bit like a temporal field defect here and similar temporal field finding abs abnormalities here on, on the right side. But I would say that these findings are equivocal at best. But when we look at the OCTs, what you can see here and what I'm showing you are the ganglion cell complex maps is that both here in the right eye as well as here in the left eye, 
you can see this bi-nasal thinning of the ganglion cell complex. And we now know that this is strongly associated with a compressive or a traumatic lesion of the optic chiasm. And in many instances may actually precede the, the bitemporal hemianopia that we associate with chiasmal compression. And indeed, looking at this individual's MRI, there's a mid-sagittal cut showing this hypo-intense lesion as it is growing up from the floor of the cella, compressing the chiasm that is directly above. And looking at this tumor here on coronal view, this iso-intense lesion that I'm pointing to you here, this is all this patient's pituitary adenoma and this bright band that you can see draped over the top of this tumor is the optic chiasm. And remember, it's those nasal fibers at the center that are most prone to this compressive force. And getting back to what is the value of this? Well, this is a, this is a great paper that was reported on uh, in the journal Pituitary in 2018 from the team at Emory University, specifically calling attention to this binasal, this binasal ganglion cell thinning that is that oftentimes precedes the bitemporal hemianopia. So two ways of looking at this. The individuals that should that present to you with binasal thinning on the OCT of the ganglion cells, be suspicious of a chiasmal lesion. For individuals that you're already suspicious of a chiasmal lesion based upon their based upon their visual field findings, look for the binasal thinning as it relates to the OCT. Now, let's move on and talk about retrochiasmal lesions, notably lesions of the optic tract, as well as the geniculocalcarin radiations. Now, if you have a lesion of either tract or geniculocalcarin radiations, this will produce insult to the ipsilateral temporal axonal fibers and the contralateral nasal axonal fibers that have decussated within the chiasm. So what this means, and we know that this correlates with a homonymous hemianopia opposite the side of the lesion. But what I'm going to show you now is evidence of ipsilateral temporal ganglion cell interplexiform layer thinning combined with contralateral nasal ganglion cell interplexiform layer thinning. So here's a 21-year-old woman who had a history of intractable epilepsy, and she underwent a hemispherectomy of her left cerebral hemisphere at the age of 12. So essentially, her entire, the entire left cerebral hemisphere was removed. So this resulted in a right-sided hemiparesis, along with a right homonymous hemianopia. She is somewhat aphasic. Her visual acuities are pretty good, 20-25 in the right eye, 20-20 in the left eye. She does have a subtle or a one-plus relative afferent pupillary defect in the right eye, and you're going to see why in just a moment. Now, these are her fundi. Now, the left eye, these are myelinated nerve fibers, so don't worry about that. But in the right eye, what you can see is that there is this, what is commonly referred to as bow tie optic atrophy. So the temporal fibers are pale or the temporal, uh, there's this temporal pallor to the nerve along with this nasal notch of pallor. And that is due to compression of the nasal fibers of the contralateral optic tract that are subserving both the macular region as well as the temporal or as well as rather the nasal insertion into the optic nerve. And because there are more nasal fibers that go back than temporal fibers, that's why we also have an afferent pupillary defect in the right eye. Now, looking at the OCT findings, and I see, think you can see this beautifully if you look at the retinal thickness map, you can see that in the right eye, which is contralateral to the side of her hemispherectomy, that the nasal 
the, the, the nasal hemifield as it relates to the macula is significantly thin. And then here in the left eye or on the ipsilateral side of the hemispherectomy, we see this thinning down of the ganglion of the ganglion cell complex. So homonymous thinning of the ganglion cell complex to go along with a homonymous hemianopia in the setting of both optic tract as well as geniculocalcarin radiation lesions. This is a 61-year-old man who I recently saw. He had a history of cerebral palsy on his right side with a right side hemi uh, with a uh, I'm sorry, on his, on his left side with a right side, or he's, he has a history of cerebral palsy with a right-sided hemiparesis. He also has glaucoma, which makes his visual field findings a little, uh, which dirties up the, the visual field findings. Visual acuities are fine, 2025 in the right eye, 2025 in the left eye. Now, if we look at his visual fields, what you can see is he has something that corresponds to a right homonymous hemianopia. So this is the left field the, on the left side right field on the right side, you can see that there's evidence of a right homonymous hemianopia. And then particularly in the left eye, you can see that there is this arcuate bundle defect denser above than below. And that's part of his glaucoma. But let's focus on the right homonymous hemianopia. So that ostensibly is related to a retrochiasmal lesion on the left side of the brain. And Looking at the GCC findings, it's not quite as striking as the previous case, but here you can see this very nice hemifield thinning of the ganglion cell complex, both here nasally in the right eye and here temporally in the left eye. So I'm discussing this with this individual, and I said, you know, I think that this is all related to your, I, this is all related to your cerebral palsy, but if you don't mind, I would recommend that we go ahead and get an MRI. He goes, well, you know what? I just had an MRI, and my brother has those, those images on his photograph, on his phone rather. Let me call him right now. And this is his brother's phone image of this gentleman's T1 weighted axial cut through his brain showing this very large oops, parencephalic cyst on the left side producing this right hemifield thinning of the ganglion cell complex and along with that his right homonymous hemianopia. So point being Use the, you know, if you think you have a homonymous visual field defect or you think you have a bitemporal visual field defect, uh, it, this doesn't always work, but certainly get an OCT to essentially check yourself. Now, there, for, the, for those fibers that correspond, the, that, 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 that involve the optic tract as it relates to these retrochiasmal lesions and ganglion cell thinning, uh, it occurs typically very quickly uh, with lesions of the optic tract, with lesions beyond the lateral geniculate nucleus, it typically takes about five to six months, so a little bit longer. Now I want to finish. I want to finish tonight's discussion by talking about OCT and a variety of neurodegenerative disorders, and begin with talking about OCT findings with multiple sclerosis. So, what's the value of using OCT in the evaluation of MS patients? Well, there are a couple of reasons for this. One is that OCT allows for a detailed evaluation of non-myelinated, non-myelinated central nervous system axons. And that we now, and you know, for over for at least the past 10 to 15 years, OCT findings have become reliable biomarkers as it relates to many clinical trials within the setting of multiple sclerosis. And that furthermore, not only looking at disease disability is related to MRI lesions and EDSS scales, but OCT findings and progressive thinning of, the, of, of, of both nerve fiber layer as well as you will see ganglion cell thickness strongly correlates to both, to, to both disease progression as well as other quality of life measures in the setting of multiple sclerosis. Now, let's begin by talking about OCT with optic neuritis. Very, very quickly, 
after an episode of optic neuritis, which is the most common neuropthalmic manifestation of multiple sclerosis, you're going to see significant thinning down of the retinal nerve fiber layer and the ganglion cell interplexiform layer complex. So typically, there is at least 20 to 40 percent thinning of these tissues, typically within three months. So to illustrate that, here's a 45-year-old woman who presents with optic neuritis in her left eye. And her visual acuity is at baseline 2020 in the right eye, 2500 in the left eye with a marked left afferent pupillary defect. If we look at the OCTs, what you can see is that early on, the nerve fiber layer and the ganglion cell complex essentially look normal. The only thing that's a little out of the norm is what I'm pointing to right here. And that is this little bit of thickening to the nerve fiber layer in the left eye, in the eye with the optic neuritis. And we now know that with retrobulbar optic neuritis, this is pretty common as you see this early thinning. You may not be able to appreciate it clinically, but you see this, the little bit of thickening to the retinal nerve fiber layer with the OCT. Now, this is her clinical presentation in July of 2019. Here she is in September of 2019. Visual acuity has improved to 2020. But what you can now begin to see is this rather dramatic thinning down to the retinal nerve fiber layer, notably here involving the temporal aspect of of the optic nerve. And then also along with that, if you compare the ganglion cell layer, here, here's the normal ganglion cell layer in the right eye. Here's the eye with the optic neuritis. You can see this rapid thinning down of the ganglion cell layer. And in February of 2020, she, she still has 2020 vision, but we see once again, this progressive thinning down of the nerve fiber layer as well as of the ganglion cell layer in the eye with the optic neuritis. So essentially what I'm showing you here is something that looks like this. On the right side, sequentially over four visits, we see complete stability of the nerve fiber layer in the normal eye. But in the left eye, what you can see is that you've gone from a slightly thickened retinal nerve fiber layer appearance to progressive thinning notably involving the temporal aspect of the retinal nerve fiber layer. So essentially, you get this paradoxical finding in the setting of optic neuritis. Is that literally, as their vision is getting better, their tissue is progressively thinning down. Here's a 31-year-old woman the 10 year history of relapsing multiple sclerosis. And you know, this is the most common form of MS where individuals have these attacks, these demyelinating attacks where they become symptomatic and then they get better. And then they flare and then they get better. So that's the relapsing remitting course of their multiple sclerosis. Now she is undergoing an infusion therapy with uh, ocrelizumab. She previously, previously had an episode of optic neuritis where she lost vision in her right eye with excellent visual recovery. And what you can see here is that her visual acuities are now 20-20 in the right eye and 20-20 in the left eye. Now, if we look at her optic nerves, beginning with the right eye, the eye where she had optic neuritis, here you can see that there is this temporal wedge of pallor involving the neuroretinal rim. And the, net, and the nerve fiber layer. In the left eye, what you can see is what appears to be a fairly normal appearance to the optic nerve, pretty much normal pinkness, pinkness in all quadrants. Now, looking at the OCTs, what you can see is that in the right eye, where this individual has optic neuritis, there is this to be expected pronounced thinning down of the retinal nerve fiber layer, notably involving the temporal sector. But in addition to that, what you can see is that in her eye without her optic neuritis is that she similarly has thinning 
of the temporal nerve fiber layer. So what's going on with that? Well, we now know that even in the absence, even in the absence of optic neuritis, for individuals, particularly those individuals with MS that are showing progression to their disease process, so too you can see progressive thinning of both the retinal nerve fiber layer as well as the ganglion cell complex. So point being is even in the absence of optic neuritis, it's common to see thinning of both the nerve fiber layer as well as the ganglion cell complex in the setting of multiple sclerosis. Now, this is a slide, uh, this, is, this is one of Dr. Laura Balser's slides. Dr. Balser is now uh, the vice chair of neurology at uh, NYU Langone Medical Center. But this was a study uh, that was done when she was at the University of Pennsylvania back in 2006. And back then, uh, it, it, it was, it, it, there was just beginning to become this evolution of using the OCT as not only a tool to look at nerve fiber layer thinning with optic neuritis, but also to look at nerve fiber layer thinning and, and other biomarkers of disease activity among individuals with multiple sclerosis. And what they found in this study in 2006 was that, yes, with optic neuritis, you're going to get this significant thinning down of nerve fiber layer tissue, but even in the absence of optic neuritis. And that's this middle bar here. These are individuals with MS with no prior history of optic neuritis. And their nerve fiber layers are thinned as well, not as thin as the cohort with optic neuritis, but certainly significantly thinner than those individuals with disease-free control eyes. And this is something that has been studied and has been reported on quite extensively uh, over the past 15 years or so. And you know, we, we now know that not only is there thinning, do you expect to see thinning of the nerve fiber layer among individuals with MS in the absence of optic neuritis, but there is this preference, there is this predilection for the temporal, for, for the temporal nerve fiber layer. Here's a case of a 30-year-old woman. One year history of relapsing MS. This woman is also undergoing infusion therapy with ocrelizumab, but no prior history of optic neuritis. Her visual acuities are normal, 20-20 in the right eye, 20-20 in the left eye. Looking at her brain, what you can see are multiple high signal ovoid lesions within the paraventricular white matter. Some of these are enhancing, some of them are not. So this defines her multiple sclerosis. But looking at her OCTs, what I'm calling your attention to here is this bitemporal thinning of the nerve fiber layer. And again, I call this to your attention as this is something that is commonly found among individuals with multiple sclerosis, even in the absence of optic neuritis. And so too, can we use this as a surrogate biomarker of disease activity? And going back to 2013, this very nice study by Ratchford and colleagues, where they looked at OCT findings, comparing them with quality of life measures, EDSS scales, and, and, and MRI, uh, MRI findings. And what they found was this nice statistical correlation for those individuals showing progressive disease activity as evidenced by a higher or, or, or increased burden of lesion load on the MRI, as well as other biomarkers, is that these individuals also showed thinning down of both the ganglion cell complex as well as the nerve fiber layer in the setting of multiple sclerosis. So you may be asking yourself, how does this stuff correlate with visual function? Well, their visual acuities are usually pretty good, but if you, more, if you use more sensitive tests, such as low contrast letter acuity measurement or what we used to in the old days call contrast sensitivity. And sometimes even with good visual fields is that 
even with, with normal visual acuity, there is subclinical involvement of the vision, particularly with thinning down of the nerve of, uh, that we see on the of tissue on the OCT. This is a nice study that was published just a couple of years ago in the Journal of Neuroophthalmology, showing exactly that in that while both nerve fiber layer and ganglion cell thickness are are both are both associated with reduced visual function, particularly with low contrast letter acuity measurement. It's it, was, it, it, it was in this study the ganglion cell layer that had a stronger overall correlation to the visual dysfunction. And you know what? If you think about it, that really makes sense because at the end of the day. That's where the action is. I mean, the ganglion cells, I mean, that is, that, that is the, that is the substrate for vision as it relates to the inner retinal layers and specifically the nerve fiber layer. And that's also why you know, certainly you've heard this with glaucoma is this evolution of looking more at ganglion cell thinning and patterns of ganglion cell thinning with glaucoma. Certainly we're doing the same thing in, in, within neuroophthalmology. Okay, let's move on now and talk about uh, Parkinson's disease. And uh, the OCT findings. Now, with Parkinson's disease, um, there it, it, it's important to understand you know, literally what's happening to these individuals, or what you know, what is the you know, what is the uh, you know, what happens with with Parkinson's disease in general. And very simply put, with Parkinson's disease, you have reduced dopamine levels, and you have reduced dopamine levels within three main areas of the body. You get it within the basal ganglia or within the brainstem. You also get it within the visual cortex, and that to a large extent is what is thought to be related to the visual hallucinations that individuals report in the setting of Parkinson's disease. But also the amacrine cells within the retina release dopamine. So that if there are reduced levels of dopamine within the, within the retina, this is less dopamine that can bind to retinal receptors. And this is responsible for a number of things. One is circadian rhythm. There is an inversely proportionate relationship between dopamine levels and melatonin levels. So that in the daytime, dopamine levels are at their maximum within the retina. And then in the evening, as, as the sun goes down, as the lights go out, the retinal dopamine levels go down and that triggers an increase in the melatonin levels. And within the retina are these very special cells called intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. And these are largely responsible for circadian rhythm. And dopamine plays a critical role in regulating that sleep versus awake state or circadian rhythm. So let's get back to this. That's not the only thing that dopamine is responsible for in the retina. It, it, it is responsible for overall cellular integrity, particularly as it relates to the inner structures within the sensory retina. So it stands to reason that if you had reduced levels of dopamine, such as in the setting of Parkinson's disease, that there may be findings measurable on the OCT. And indeed, that's true. Now, the first study to really look at this uh, was a study back in, I think, 2013, 2014. It was a Korean study. And what they found was a thinning down of optic nerve and retinal OCTs in the setting of Parkinson's disease, and that the in that and that those individuals with with thinner retinal and optic nerve tissue were those that were more prone to be uh, experiencing severity as it related to the to the severity of their Parkinson's disease, as well as some of the visual phenomena associated with Parkinson's disease. But, 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 but over the years, and looking at a number of clinical trials, and looking at meta-analysis, 
um, that reduction in dopamine levels within the retina essentially takes its toll as it relates to cellular integrity and tissue integrity. So that in the setting of Parkinson's disease, there is both, there is nerve fiber layer thinning as well as ganglion cell thinning. And that interestingly enough, the nerve fiber layer thinning with Parkinson's disease tends to be very, very similar in pattern to that that I've already discussed with you in the setting of MS. So we said that with MS, even in the absence of optic neuritis, you can get this thinning and with disease progression, progressive disease thinning, more so involving the temporal aspect of the nerve fiber layer as compared to other, as compared to others, as compared to other quadrants. And that seems to hold true with Parkinson's disease as well. And the other thing, as I've already alluded to, is that with progression of Parkinson's disease, it's very, very common to see progressive thinning of these OCT parameters, both ganglion cell thinning, as well as nerve fiber layer thinning as it, with, with progression of disease activity. I want to move on now and talk about Alzheimer's disease. And with that, a little bit of history. So Alzheimer's disease is named for the German psychiatrist and pathologist Alois Alzheimer who in 1906 reported on the findings, the post-mortem findings of a patient of his named August Dieter. And this was an individual that had been, had been on his psychiatry ward for a period of several years, showing progressive decline of cognitive function. And Dr. Alzheimer was able to chart her progress quite diligently over time. And upon her demise, had her brain autopsied, where there were these macroscopic findings, as well as microscopic findings, that ultimately he reported on as a peculiar disease of the cerebral cortex. And essentially, that is where, that was the first histopathologic documentation known in the setting of Alzheimer's dementia. So we know that with Alzheimer's disease, that the hallmark of this is the accumulation of extracellular amyloid plaques along with intracellular neurofibrillary tangles that are composed of this rather glommy substance called tau, T-A-U. Now tau is a substance that Tau is a protein that is responsible for binding together the neurotubules of axons within the central nervous system. And as there is a breakdown of these axons, there is this dispersal of tau where it forms together, forming these complexes that is largely thought to be neurotoxic. So I'm going to get back to this in just a couple of moments as it relates to chronic traumatic encephalopathy. But as it relates to Alzheimer's dementia, this is the histopathology of Alzheimer's, which is the extracellular accumulation of amyloid plaques and the intracellular accumulation of, in, of, of neurofibrillary tangles composed of a protein called tau. Now, one other thing as it relates to the genetics of Alzheimer's disease in that there is a mutation that leads to something called an APOE4 allele. And people that have that genetic marker are more prone to have this buildup of amyloid plaques, extracellular amyloid within the brain. And they're also more prone to have elevated cholesterol levels because the APOE4 allele, when you have this, it inhibits the sequestration of both beta amyloid within the central nervous system, as well as cholesterol throughout within the blood. So getting back to this, as it relates to the eye and Alzheimer's disease, 
going back to the 1980s, it was established that individuals with Alzheimer's dementia had histopathologic findings within their optic nerve that were somewhat abnormal. Uh, and this is a landmark study by Hinton and colleagues that was reported on in the New England Journal of Medicine back in 1986, where they looked at postmortem specimens of optic nerves among individuals, among 10 opti among, 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 uh, among patients with Alzheimer's disease. And what they found within this cohort was that overwhelmingly there was this widespread de degeneration of the optic nerve axons. Uh, perhaps more so those axons resp responsible for M cell, uh, M cell connectivity. But back then in the 1980s, based upon histopathology, you know, it, it, um, you know there, there was this flurry of activity as it related to, well, you know, perhaps you know, things can be done related to vision, pupillary function, and all sorts of other things as it related to using the eye and using vision as potentially a surrogate biomarker of Alzheimer's dementia. Now, unfortunately, back in the 1980s, of course, there were no OCTs. So, you know, a lot of this stuff was simply speculative based upon conjecture. But of course, now with the advent of OCTs, we have seen quite a bit of information over the past probably 15 years as it relates to both nerve fiber layer as well as ganglion cell thinning in the setting of Alzheimer's dementia. So, and it, it, it to, to a large extent, this, this makes sense. I mean, there, you know, what, 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 what is probably happening is that you have a neurodegenerative disease within the brain, understanding that the eye and specifically the optic nerves are tracks of the brain is that you now get this retrograde degeneration into the optic nerves, into the retina, as a consequence of cerebral neurodegeneration. Now, if we think about what's going on within the eye and as it relates to OCT, both nerve fiber layer as well as ganglion cell complexes show thinning in the setting of Alzheimer's disease. And furthermore, um, studies, are, studies have shown that this too tends to go along with the progression of the disease, that the thinner the nerve fiber layer, um, the higher the disease burden, largely based upon symptom scores. So once again, using the eye, potentially using vision, as a surrogate biomarker of, of, of disease activity of the central nervous system. Now, I wanna conclude um, with a discussion of a topic area um, that I've been involved with for roughly the past 10, 11 years. And that is looking at vision, visual motor function, and most recently looking at structural changes within the eyes of individuals in, in response to traumatic brain injury or concussion. And most recently, potentially using vision and using OCT findings as a surrogate biomarker as it relates to chronic traumatic encephalopathy. So when we think about tra traumatic brain injury in general, this is literally nothing more than a rapid stretching of axons. So when someone is concussed, either as a direct blow to the head, which is linear acceleration, or a whiplash injury, which is rotational acceleration or angular acceleration, there is this rapid stretching of axons. And you can think of it this way, as though you know, axons are like rubber bands. If you stretch them and you let them come back, essentially they look about the same but there may be microstructural changes within the rubber band that affects the function, even to a minute level. Well, within the brain, in the setting of concussion, you get this rapid stretching of axons that leads to massive depolarization and, a hyper, and, and, and periods of hyperglycolysis where the brain is trying to repair itself. And then after this 
momentary period or this, this, this limited period of hyperglycolysis, the brain begins to slow down. And it does so because also in the setting of concussion, there is reduced cerebral blood flow. So essentially, you end up with a brain that is going to sleep in the set as a result of an energy crisis. Now, part of that energy crisis is directly related to an osmotic imbalance that occurs in the setting of concussion, traumatic brain injury, where there's a rapid influx of calcium coupled by an egress of potassium. And this essentially allows for depolarization of cells and the liberation of glutamate. Now, under normal circumstances, glutamate, it's liberated, it creates a nerve impulse, and then it's taken up back by the surrounding uh, glial elements of the brain. But with concussion, it just floods, it, it floods the synapse and it stays there, allowing for this continued depolarization and this hyperexcitability of axons. So what actually happens over time then is not only are these cells exciting themselves to death, but this calcium that's accumulating within the axons has some interesting properties in that it is promoting, it, it, what, what it's doing is it's tying up the normal metabolic pathways, and particularly the, inhibi the, the ability of mitochondrial to produce ATP. But the other thing that calcium is doing is that it is responsible for the degradation of these microtubules and this dispersal of tau. And ultimately, the tau that's accumulating within the setting of repetitive traumatic brain injury is somewhat unique. It's different than the accumulation of tau that is associated with Alzheimer's disease. With repetitive traumatic brain injury, the tau accumulates around retinal blood vessels at the base of cortical cell site. And that, that is the histopathology of chronic traumatic encephalopathy. So there's been a lot that's been reported on with chronic traumatic encephalopathy over the years. And um, you know, one of the individuals that's been really at the center of this universe is an individual named Ann McKee. And Dr. McKee is a neuropathologist at Boston University. And uh, back in the late, two, back, back around 2007, 2008, 2009, uh, she began looking at the brains of individuals, uh, notably uh, retired a athletes, boxers, football players. And, and some of her early work was really invested in staining techniques to look at tau and beta amyloid in the setting of Alzheimer's disease. But what she found where these were brains of individuals that didn't have Alzheimer's disease. These were individuals who had a history of collision sport activity, notably boxers and football players. And she began finding this accumulation of tau at the base of cortical sulci surrounding blood vessels, and particularly within the prefrontal part of the brain, as well as within the hippocampus. And to take this story to something of a conclusion, um, I remember being on a conference call with Dr. McKee a number of years ago, where she said, you know, you know, I've been studying the brains of these individuals for a number of years, and these are the classic histopathologic features of CTE. And then, you know, I began looking at the spinal, you know, began harvesting spinal cords of, of these individuals. And I began finding tau accumulating within the spinal cord, suggesting that what's going on in the brain may now be migrating into the spinal cord, producing other neuromotor signs and symptoms. And she, goes, most re and she said, most recently, I began harvesting the retina of these individuals. And I'm now beginning to detect the presence of tau within the retina and specifically within the ganglion cell complex. And she went on to say, I have no idea what the ganglion cell complex is or what it does, but I've got really good slides that show the, this accumulation of tau. So based upon this and others' work, you know, there, is this, there, is this, you know, there, there is this now recognized fact that with repetitive head injury, 
that there may be this dispersal of tau that is now ending up within the retina, within the optic nerve and within the retina. And perhaps there are ways of looking at that, if not directly, then indirectly. So several years ago, we conducted a study um, at our center in Chicago, at, um, as well as at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, where we looked at cohorts of individuals, where, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, as, as well as NYU Langone Medical Center, where we looked at roughly, we looked at 46 individuals with a history of collision sport activity. So these were retired boxers as well as retired NFL players. And we did a series of tests on them, one being OCTs, as well as looking at, at, low, at, at, lo looking at low contrast letter acuity testing. And interestingly enough, what we found on the, OCT, on the OCT side was that as compared to the age matched healthy controls is that both the nerve fiber layers as well as the ganglion cell complexes were significantly thinner. And that this also correlated with poor performance visual performance on low contrast letter acuity measurements. Now, you may say to yourself, well, yeah, but, you know, particularly with boxers, these are people that are getting hit in the eye. And, you know, maybe all you're looking at are, is the direct effect of concussive blows to the retina. And that may very well be true, but we really didn't think that that was probably the case based upon the data analysis because we found that it was e there was this equal distribution between the two eyes. And, you know, when you talk to fighters and you talk to you know, uh, 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 ring physicians is that boxers, be, you know, be they right-handed boxers, be they left-handed boxers, tend to be hit more so on one side of the face than the other. So what we think may be happening in these instances is that there is this neurodegenerative process within the brain that is now translating in a retrograde fra fashion along the optic nerves into the retina, and that indirectly that may be what we're measuring in looking at the OCTs. Now, following our study, there was a longitudinal study that was reported on of Olympic, of Olympic boxers uh, in the United Kingdom, where similarly, they, they found thinning of the nerve fiber layer, as well as macular thickness. Macular thickness really means you have thinning of the ganglion cell complex in a longitudinal fashion among boxers as compared to age match controls. Uh, and then there was a study recently reported um, at the University of Iowa by, by Dr. Randy Cardin and colleagues showing this significant thinning of the retinal nerve fiber layer among military veterans with a history of blast injuries versus controls, where the TBI cohort, they were showing a thinning of their retinal nerve fiber layer of about 1.25 microns per year as compared to 0.1 microns per year among a normal aging population. So again, calling into question that perhaps what we are indirectly looking at is neurodegeneration of the brain that is now translating in a retrograde fashion into the eye where it can be evaluated with OCT. So to conclude, um, we know that OC, there's been a lot that has been reported on as it relates to OCT in the setting of retinal disease. And certainly our retinal colleagues, you know, evaluating individuals with diabetic retinopathy, evaluating individuals with age-related macular degeneration, certainly OCT testing has become part and parcel and standard of care as we evaluate these individuals. Uh, so too, certainly with glaucoma, initially lurking, looking at nerve fiber layers, and more recently looking at neuroretinal rim or the minimum rim width. And along with that pattern thinning of the ganglion cell layer, the ganglion cell complex, uh, of course, is now standard of care as it relates to glaucoma. But so too, I hope that I've been able to impress upon you what I think is this very exciting uh, emerging topic of OCT findings uh, not just with papilledema or differentiating papilledema from pseudopapilledema, 
uh, but certainly looking at individuals with a wide variety of neurodegenerative disorders and looking at tissue thinning, structural changes among individuals with MS, among individuals with Parkinson's disease, among individuals with Alzheimer's dementia. And then lastly, I've shared with you some of the work that we've done among individuals with uh, traumatic brain injury. So I, I bring this to your attention from the standpoint of you know, stay tuned and stay knowledgeable within this area because you, know, you are the ones that, I mean, you, you own this technology. I mean, you are the ones that are able to understand this from a physiologic basis, from a clinical basis, and specifically know how to interpret these findings, you know, more than, you know, more than, more than other medical colleagues. So, uh, again, um, I think that we're, you know, I, I think that we're looking at a very exciting future as it relates to OCT with a wide variety of neurologic and neuroophthalmic problems. So with that, uh, that concludes my presentation, uh, and I, I'm very happy to uh, answer any questions that you may have. That was awesome, Dr. Mesner. Thank you so much. This is such an interesting topic, and so many people, I think, are very uncomfortable with neurooptometry, but you just have some amazing case reports and slides and pictures that I think it made it very easy to understand. And I think a lot of people are feeling a lot more comfortable now.